My name is Stanley Sword. I have the great pleasure and privilege to meet Nikolai Sorensen from Rexo, the pharmaceutical company yep. I have grown in the last uh, in the last years and become mm-hmm. also a profitable company. Yes. It's a strange thing that uh, the the more projects and the better it goes uh, f- from start, the, the bigger the loss becomes in some sense because you have three stages before a, mm-hmm. a uh, drug is can can be FDA approved and yep. come into the market in the US and in Europe and mm-hmm. at Japan. There's three agencies across the world mm-hmm. in the Western world yeah. that you have to Approved. cross the border. Yep. And you just won a major legal battle in the US, mm-hmm. a four year struggle yep. that costed uh, somewhere thirty million dollars, yep. twenty five million dollars. Mm-hmm. It's uh, and it's also a cost uh, because it it freezes your organization. Mm-hmm. It freezes freezes the, the possibilities. You were a BCG consultant from 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 start, Boston Consulting mm-hmm. Group. Can you measure the cost of of lost opportunities? Is that possible? I I, I think that's a maybe you could do I, I could look at some of the concrete opportunities that have passed our ways and, and where these opportunities have not materialized um, and they so one where it's probably good that it never materialized we had one discussion when we started uh, there was an, a company where we discussed the collaboration and, and that company today has some, unfortunately they also ended up in a patent <laughs> li- litigation yeah. uh, and they lost uh, all the way to, to uh. federal court where we won so that one was probably good we never did a, a deal with uh, and then there was another one where uh, looking at where they ended up we probably should have done a deal that that we simply were not able to find a, a, a and we can say a fair pricing because from Orexo we have been so convinced that we had a strong case and we would prevail in the end so we were not we were not willing to give any discount on our what we found was a fair market cap, uh, capitalization of market value of the company mm-hmm. uh, and the other company with that overhang of passing litigation was uh, I would probably say of course not willing to pay uh, the full uh, premium required to compensate for for that mm-hmm. uh, overhang from the passing litigation so that has stopped us and I, and I think the uh, but, but I, it's it's the the thing that happens of course is with that awareness our work to 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 generate new opportunities have also been put a little on the freeze mm-hmm. uh, we did a lot of work, for example, right before we got the district court decision, we worked for the, nearly the full year to generate interest from the U.S. investor community. And then when the district court decision, which was a split decision, so part we won half of it and we, we lost the other half. Uh, I think a lot of people thought we would lose both, but because we were the small player against a we were micro player against a really big giant in these yeah, parts and the Tiva from uh, Tiva, Israel. Yeah, it's today's Tiva. Yeah, it's, they, they acquired our opponent, which is activists. So today, today it's Tiva, but we started as activists. Mm. Uh, so so, I, so that, I, I think there's definitely the vision that we had for the company and how we wanted to develop and gain even stronger foothold in the US is uh, something we had to put a little on hold. Um, but right now it feels like we are, we, you know, we, we we're like mm. uh, cows who, are, who are after a big winter, we've just been put out on grass and then everyone in the company is basically jumping around to, yeah. to, to, to with new energy and new enthusiasm to, to try to find, uh, to regain some of the opportunities we might have lost. And when you started out five and a half mm-hmm. years ago as a CEO, mm-hmm. there were several people in mm-hmm. the US in your organization. Now there's a hundred people. And sadly enough, it's, it's a growing problem in the US. It's, mm-hmm. it's a, uh, it's on Netflix documentaries. Mm-hmm. You're fighting the opiate addiction yep. with a drug mm-hmm. that uh, will hopefully take people off the addiction and to to treat it long term. But but it's a it's a hard disease. It's it's a disease that isn't really curable, according to you. No, I, I think there's a so so. I, I think what what makes a disease horrible. Uh, I think a disease that is horrible is causing death. The, the, if you're really in a vicious circle of, of addiction, have been addicted for many years, 
I know you have used the analog. This is like playing Russian Russian roulette with your life, or actually it's just the opposite. I think rather than one bullet, you probably have five bullets in your gun, mm. and one of them is free because the likelihood that you will end up with an overdose that is lethal is nearly a hundred percent if you've been through this for a long period of time. Uh, then of course there's a very few people who actually succeed. So so if we it's lethal. The suffering of the people who are opioid addicted, I think it, it just takes you a trip to a central station in any big city and look at the people who are sitting there behind and, and trying to, often very skinny, they, so they clearly don't get food, they're dirty, the people who, who have a, a life in misery that we can't even imagine. So the misery is there. If you go to the people who is around them, it's it's basically, it's definitely something that is affecting everyone. I, I watched one of these documentaries uh, two weeks ago, uh, actually the same day, uh, two, three weeks ago exactly, because it was the night when we, when we won the patent litigation. And it was about a, a, a girl who was, a, an, a, an, or a son who was an addict to a family. But that addiction... Mm. It's of course affecting the entire family. His, mm. his, uh, so in the end, his mother called the police because her son wouldn't uh, he, he wouldn't let them go. Yeah. Okay, so. I saw the same documentary. It's 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 three mm. percent of the population in the US are addicted, but it's much more. It's per- perhaps ten percent that's affected by by that addiction. No, it's it's true. Uh, and I think the final step is is the people who are affected. They're young. They, this is not like, I, of course, it's horrible to get get cancer or Alzheimer's. It's horrible diseases. But the majority of people who they affect, they're in the, the last, like you say, the last, uh, on statistics, the last 10, 20 years of their life. Mm. The people who get addicted to opioids, the majority of them, they're in their teens. They're in the age where you should have your full life ahead of you. But where the addiction and Often it just starts with a physician who's prescribing you an opioid for a legitimate sports injury. Yeah. And then when you get that, you suddenly get into this vicious circle of addiction. So you go from being a star cheerleader or from a star football player mm. to become basically a living zombie. Uh, and that misery is something that, that, and the cost for society is, is so enormous that I can't even, it numbers that I can't imagine. And you're, you're, you're a consultant from, from start mm-hmm. at BCG. If we were to take Boston Consulting Group and, and eject it as a parachute uh, troop mm-hmm. in the US and, and to, to eradicate the problem you know, as much as you can on, on society level, mm-hmm. so to say, what would you do to, to make it disappear? For the future, I, I, for coming I think, generations. I think you need to, to end, you need to work on, on multiple ends, uh, and I think the the one thing is to to realize that this is a disease like oncology or or, or cancer. Or it's a disease like Alzheimer's, and, and we need to treat it like a disease, and we need to put the resources into this like it was a disease. So, but if you start from the start, I, I think you need to work on the prevention. How can we get away from if U.S. physicians? using opioids as the first treatment of pain. Now, I think they are on that way, but still 30% of the, the young people in the U.S. that are first exposed to opioids is when they go to the dentist. So 30% of the people, the young people in the U.S. who hmm. get an opi- opioid is getting the first time is getting from the dentist, which is probably because you get your wisdom teeth pulled. Yeah, uh, I, I've had the unfortunate pleasure of not only my wisdom teeth, but uh, one more ta- tooth I've been pulled from, from my mouth. And, and it's painful, it's hurtful, but at least I could, I could survive the few days of pain using uh, NSAID products that I got for, over the counter from the pharmacy. Hmm. So you need to move that and you need to find new medications that the physicians use instead. The other part you need to do is that you need to to work on the treatment. And here today, there are so many restrictions on the physicians who can treat. And I think you need to realize this is if this has been Ebola or something that has happened to use, every doctor would have been forced into treatment. I think the severity of the issue right now requires the same kind of determination. So you should go out and tell every single physician in the U.S. you have to scan through all of your patients who have an opioid prescription mm. and you need to call them in to check whether they are at risk to, of being addicted. And if they have shown signs of addiction, 
you should try to transfer them to a treatment yeah. which is less addictive or at least is helping them to get back to a normal life and increasing the chance of a full recovery where our product is, is one such product that you could use. So you need to get people into treatment much earlier and I think it should be a big alarm system in the, in the patient record system. If someone has been for an opioid for more than two or three months, there should be an alarm say, here is something, as a doctor, check this patient. He mm. or she has been on an opioid for several months. And the only reason we can give an opioid, which is a very powerful pain medication, is if the person has severe cancer or, or other very severe conditions. But often the people who are on an opioid are people who maybe had a broken leg. Mm. It's people who had a knee injury. And, and that one I know myself, my wife had a very serious knee injury earlier this year. Yeah. And she was on opioids in the beginning. Uh, but after two or three months, uh, she she phased it out. And, and today it's, it's only a paracetamol once in a while when she's in pain. Whereas I think her pain level would actually in the US and her injury would have made her very subject. She could just continue to get an opioid prescribed. And, and there I think the mentality of a physician, the easy choice is just renew the pain medication if the patient come back and ask for more. Mm. Rather than like, okay, Nikolai, you come and ask me now for the four, it's four months ago you had your knee injury. The pain level in an average patient should not require opioids at this time. Should we look at other alternatives? And if you let it go too long and then you cut it off, then people are already addicted and they go out in the street to mm -hmm. buy the same pills that's and later true. on perhaps heroin and other things mm -hmm. to, to, uh, that's cheaper. So it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. creating a, a loop of problems that are really hard to eject from. I, I think I have one example. It's, it's, uh, it's a few years back, but in Philadelphia they did this... Uh, Kind of, they they saw they did the way that uh, I would have liked to. So they went through patient records for P, for young people under a certain age, and they identified a, a group of of these young people who were on pain medications who probably don't have a medical condition that should require pain medication with opioids, and they then withdrew the prescription. Mm -hmm. The problem for these patients is that the solution for the society was take away the prescription. But if you're already addicted, mm. you basically have a, you have a brain damage that may or may not over time repair itself. But at that time, you are addicted and to just remove the opioids that they just got. Those mm. patients, they get full withdrawal symptoms. They get all of the abstinence symptoms that you see for a hernist. What happens is they find out that you go down on the street and someone sells you oxycodone per pill to a hysteric high price. You quite fast find out that heroin is much cheaper and the person on the street who probably have a higher margin on heroin than he or she has on, on, on the pill on, or mm. on the painkillers start selling you heroin and to get maybe in the start you actually take the heroin and, and try to drink it or you snort it but you find out that it's much cheaper actually to inject it because then you get a higher effect and then you're into a very very vicious circle and that happened in philadelphia when they took away the painkillers from these young people the use of heroin quadrupled within mm. a few months in the same group so you went from the ashes to the fire yeah and and your father is a professor in copenhagen and he's mm. uh, researched on, on on red wine before and mm. now he's into lifestyle diseases mm -hmm. um, what advice do you think you can give to people you know who, who who don't want because your 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 main goal is to work around mm -hmm. orexo shouldn't only focus on on the, the opiates it should be focused on uh, abuse substance abuse mm -hmm. for the future how can we kind of make sure that our own lives are protected against coming abuse and how can we ensure that the next generation, our children, are limited to, to exposure and, and, and don't become that. I, I, first of all, I, I think I can, uh, I, I hope that it doesn't mean that I have uh, a can't drink red wine because it's one of the f pleasures I actually, <laughs> I do like yeah. in my life. Uh, 
and also I think my father's research showed that you actually had a positive impact on your life yeah. uh, then you shouldn't drink too much of course uh, I, I think so this is very philosophical but the Danes are better than the Swedes on, on, uh, on drinking culture I, we I, do absolute in Sweden you do a little red wine in Denmark so it's I, I don't know I think we drink elephant beer from Carlsberg but that's <laughs> or Gammel Dansk no I, I think the um, so I'm unfortunately of the opinion that I think the society, as we get more and more advanced, is creating a more and more addictive culture. So it makes it easier to get addicted. I, I think people who are restless find something that is trying to keep them engaged and creating this dopamine kick that you get from, from a, a lot of the addictions. And, and whether that is from from eating more and drinking more sugar so you get maybe get obese or that is from gambling playing online games it could be also playing computer games uh, it can be uh, addictions uh, it could be even even over training too much but I, I think the and then I was getting very philosophical from a from an economist excuse my, my lack of science here but I I find that, that I believe a lot of people are missing something in their life and trying to fill that void, yeah, void with, with, uh, with gambling or with drugs. And, and that, unfortunately, creating a very negative habit. I think the, the people who want to avoid... I don't think we can we can't stop people from buying a, a lot of coupon, coupon and, and gambling once in a while. I think the, the time it gets a problem is when it's repetitive... Uh, when you see it impacts how your kid or your family member is reacting to other edges, if they're losing interest for, of everything else, mm. I think you're starting to see what is an addictive behavior because that's what you see with drugs. You lose. And that's one of the diagnostic criteria. That is your main focus. I think the same with with gambling. You're basically losing, and and you put everything else on hold. You take money from your from what should go to food to the kids or you steal mm. money from your employer to play for the gambling. So you don't care about the consequences as long as you get that one kick from gambling. I think you unfortunately see a little computer games that some kids and, and I heard from my teenage girl that there was a, a boy in school who couldn't stop playing his online game even in class. And when the teacher basically said to him, you have to turn this off, he got so angry that he threw the phone through the window. Yeah. Uh, which is kind of a, a reaction for someone who's clearly so emotionally engaged into his computer game that it's, it's becoming a problem. And, and so. before we climb to, to collect honey from wild bees and such, what can we now kind of fill that void with in our modern society? It, it's a good question. Uh, and I, I think even it's, it's, um, I don't think there's any easy solution because I, I don't think we can put honey up in the trees again and ask people to climb um, I, I hope that what at least I see a tendency to uh, at least in the Nordic countries and, and parts of the US is a is a quite significant interest in your personal health being I, I see the interest of, of going hiking and bike cycling is increasing steadily uh, so going back into na nature and actually try to keep yourself fit uh, I think it's something I, I hope is is compensating at least for me. That's uh, why I try to to get my recreation is, is to go hiking in the mountains or bicycling or skiing for that sake. Uh, and but here, I I, I think is is very difficult because everyone have in, in their basic needs is covered. We have access to clean water. We have access to sanitary systems. We have even the I think. Yeah, Poorest people in both Sweden and the U.S. have access to a reasonable amount of food, so hmm. so, so somehow I, I think this is one of society's challenges: is how do you fill the void? And, and I don't have a, an easy answer. But I, the best thing is if everyone would go out and, and walk and run and do more sports. I hope, but uh, I also realize that's probably an utopia. Yeah, and and uh, and uh, another thing with with stress, we have um, you know there's a lot of, of um, uh, you've been for the last four years involved in this legal battle and, mm -hmm. and to handle stress without alcohol without other kinds of mm -hmm. addictions how, how can you eradicate stress uh, so it doesn't become 
a negative factor for for uh, you know how, how can you hang it on the hanger when you get home from work i i think the so this is a very good i think i can i listen to people and and, and also see how it works for myself i i think the some people are very good at, at just this mindfulness and being able to push it aside um i think the big problem we have today is our cell phones are very at least my cell phone i don't know, i get a couple of hundred emails per day so i don't have to put it aside for many minutes before uh-huh. it blinks up and remind you about work uh, i i need and that's my person i need something that keep me very engaged uh, so if i go bicycling uh, then it's very difficult uh, at least so far for me to to handle my phone and my bicycle at the same mm-hmm. time <laughs> if i go to the gym also i i always leave my phone um, at home if i can mm. uh, and i think that's that is to f- do something that just forces you to do something different I, i could imagine that some people if they like to cook it's the same if you have to stand mm. and work in the kitchen it's a little difficult to to work on your cell phone at the same time i think you need to get something have an interest that take your mind away and think yeah. about something different you have two, two teenagers at home what, mm-hmm. what would be your be- three best pieces of advice for for young people today to succeed uh, for the future you found I, your I, way how I, should people no, find their way so um i have to be careful with madeline and emily here so um, <laughs> i i think that this uh the first one is is i think there's nothing that can that can um, replace passion i think you need to find something that you feel passionate about uh, and if you have the luxury to work and do something that you really feel passionate about i think you should take that focus rather than doing something that might give you a better paycheck or something mm-hmm. so the passion uh, and that's something i can feel if i didn't have the passion for my work i think the stress would have been extremely difficult to handle uh, that's number one I, i think the other one is is for especially today's youth is unfortunately there's no shortcuts uh, i think there's a lot of hard work and you need to accept that on the way to where you want to be you need to to train for a long time you use the analogy with our uh, kind of our patent litigation it's like preparing for the olympics for a long time and it's been some several hard years and, and i think for a lot of even in your career you just have to accept in the beginning of your career it, there will be some hard work to which is maybe not always the most fun but mm-hmm. as long as you do something where you know the end goal is, is something you have a passion for i think it's very important so maybe that's that's another one is kind of be prepared to roll up the sleeves and and fight mm. uh, and then I, i think the the other one is is be reflective it's kind of don't don't just continue in the in kind of in the same cockwheel and just stand on and don't reflect i think sometimes all of us need to take a step back and actually reflect are we on the right path uh, or do i need to change something in my life and don't be afraid of change uh, is, is maybe the other one so you mm. you stop and, and think because I, i think a lot of time people end up in a, in a path which is not where they want to be but because of com- complacency and then it's just convenient to stay in the same track mm. just stay there rather than taking the risk of doing something different and a leadership advice for young people if they want to become leaders for the future yeah i i just, i i think the um I, the first advice is probably try to get some exposure to leadership i i I find that a lot of the really good leaders that I've seen in my in my career has been people who have been working with um, for example young kids in in being volunteering as as uh, trainers for the football team or something different because there you need to work with multiple different personalities and get them passionate about the same goal and I think that's an that's an excellent leadership training in in young age which by the way also helps uh, for a lot of people get out and move and and yeah. it also helps on when you maybe in the future have a, uh, somewhere where you can get rid of your stress and avoid other addictions and and the last piece of advice from your years as a consultant for a Boston consulting mm-hmm. group is there anything there we can learn f- through our everyday life or our careers to evaluate it or to to you know to to highlight it or to improve it i i think the the things that that um 
simplicity that, that you learn is is uh, addressing a, a multitude of, of different opportunities and, and again i think the the one learning maybe for all of this and is life is, is nothing but life. opportunities yeah it, it's but also i think the at least what I have learned is, is often to do to do a very good preparation is the best best way to to win the fight or to as a consultant to be successful with a client is if you spend the extra hour in the beginning to prepare for how am I going to approach this problem, mm. then it's something that uh, it comes back many times in the end rather than just jumping out. So I think maybe sometimes is is uh, don't underestimate the value of preparation, which take me back to the first advice to uh, one of the advice to young people is be, be, be prepared to, to work hard and prepare yourself for what is the end goal um, rather than just think that there is a shortcut and you just jump straight ahead of it. And, and the co- projects I've seen failing is the ones where the preparations were done poorly. Yeah. The best of Thank luck you. on your journey you, towards the future. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank you a for, lot. For Take taking me here. Thank you. Thanks a lot.